Welcome to this meeting of the Economy, Environment and Infrastructure Committee. I will reiterate what I say at the start of every uh, EE&I committee, which is this is about uh, strategic issues and any operational ward issues are not a matter for this committee and should be dealt with out with the meeting. I will suggest, uh, I, I'm actually bringing item six first on the agenda when we start getting into committee reports and then before item five, um, there are some wording in that that would recommend that, that, that sort of move. Um, have we got any said on apologies? Thank you, Chair. I've got three apologies this morning uh, from Councillors Wood, Dempster and Gilroy. Um, currently two members not present being Councillors Brody and McComb. Thank you very much. Um, do any members have any declarations of interest? Andrew. Thanks, Chair. Um, my declaration is in the Schnorr item regarding the conservation area. I've forgotten what item that actually is. I think it's item 13 or so. No, item 12. Item 12, so I'll set out for that item. Okay. Uh, well, only my interest is in um, one or two items, and I'm not sure I'll be here because of the new order, but will item four be taken after five and six, or an item seven? Well, item four is a minute, so that'll be done. I'm talking about the committee reports. Item four is a minute. Right, okay, that, that's good. And seven will be taken after six. Six will be taken after four. Right, okay. okay. And then seven will come after five and six. Uh, probably won't get it. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, item number three is a minute of meeting of 13 July 2018 for approval. Agreed. Uh, item number four is a minute of enterprise subcommittee meeting of 15th August 2018 for approval. Yeah, good. Right. Well, James. Um, my comment was that. Um, Two of the items, I think, were taken in, in camera, exclusion of the public, and I'd actually wanted to check something that had been said during that period, and um, it's difficult. I know it's technically possible. I did get in touch with uh, the corporate services to, to get a copy of the recording somehow, but that hasn't... It wasn't recorded. Or oh, they told me it was recorded, but it was secretly held. It's, it's not secretly held. It's just part of a separate recording. It wouldn't be... Part of the public recording available after the meeting. So I didn't get. So is it available to members or not? Yes. Ever. I mean, it's times past now. I'm, I've kind of lost the urge to see it. But if I should have just kept going to them till they produced it, then. Is that? It? Yeah. You want to know about the procedures, Chair? Okay. Because I was quite interested to so fact, ask, fact check. If if he asked um, Rona uh, or not. Okay. Um, I just want to say a couple of things on this one. The Association of Public Service Excellence Service Award 2018 were held last week in, in Edinburgh, and these awards designed to recognise excellence in local government frontline services across the UK. They're open to all local authorities and their public sector partners. This year, the awards included 22 categories covering the vast majority of local services, as well as pr prestigious overall Council of the Year in Service Delivery Award. The winner of these awards are amongst the best at delivering outstanding public frontline service, and APSI works continually to encourage public service excellence, and APSI is delighted that all our finalists and winning councils are so highly committed to delivering the best possible services for the benefit of their communities. Enterprise and DNG were nominated within the category <coughs> Best Service Team Facility Management and Building Cleaning Service, along with Aberdeen City Council, Gateshead Council, Liverpool City Council, Powys County Council, South Tyneside Council, and the winner was Powys. Congratulations to the team from Enterprise and D&G's runners-up and for promoting Dun Dumfries and Galloway at this level. Uh, Enterprise and D&G's submission was based on Dumfries and Galloway Council changing the way we clean. Enterprise and D&G were tasked to make significant savings from their cleaning budget. Being innovative, they looked at how they could change the way their cleaning services could be delivered in a rural, rural area that covers 6,426 6, square kilometres. They have changed the way they clean by introducing five to four day cleans in schools and three to two day cleans in offices and team cleaning at the various establishments. 
The new philosophy is find it clean, keep it clean, where all employees take responsibility. So, Ronnie, if you can pass on uh, our congratulations to your team over there. Alistair, you want to say something? Yes, Chair. I, I would just like to, to add on behalf of uh, the EEI management team uh, our congratulations on your successful year as Chair of APSE National Chair. Uh, and uh, I think it's been a great success. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, my colleague Ronnie Dempster for the Secretariat uh, support that he's given during that time. Thank you, Ronnie. And it's very important that we keep in contact with these national organisations so we're not always reinventing the wheel and we're always learning in our continuous improvement process. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, now move on to item six, which is the Economy, Environment and Infrastructure Revenue Budget. And this is before we have item five. This report provides members with an overview of the detailed budget <coughs> reviews recently undertaken by the e &I management team to ensure that detailed budgets are realistic for the current financial year and to ensure the avoidance of a recurrence of budget overspending. The director and his management team uh, fully recognise the need to improve the service, the management and budget monitoring, arrangements to ensure that budgets are not overspending and income recovery is keeping pace with projected expectations. The management team have implemented a number of measures and these are clearly set out in 3.19 of the report. And these will be underpinned by a series of monthly meetings taking place at all service management levels to advise the E&I management team of the monthly monitoring positions, which will be discussed with finance colleagues. Uh, the director and his management team will take a any questions on the report, unless you've got anything to add, Director or Paul. Yeah, I have nothing to add, uh, Chair, but just to say that we do have Paul Garrett, uh, Head of uh, Finance Procurement, with us today to help answer any questions. Stephen. Thanks, Chair, uh, and I welcome this report. I understand the reason why we've had to take item six before item five. I'm sure that's the only variation to the published agenda. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, I welcome the fact that there's been a review done. I think obviously we have to be as realistic as possible given the, the climate that we're in, in terms of um, setting our budgets appropriately. Uh, obviously there's a lot of variables sometimes out with our control. Um, but I'm just looking at the recommendations. I think, um, I know at Policy and Resources, we did agree, uh, members did agree um, to uh, uh, allow an allocation uh, in principle of a corporate budget to recognise pressures of up to 552 for 2018-19. This one here, I'm just, I'm noticing the word recurring application and I understand that that appears in the narrative, but I think, um, I think it would be safer and I think it would sit more easily if there was a way we could address the issues that have been identified as part of the review. Um, so agree to submit the request to PNR for the application of 552 of corporate budget pressures um, to provide a sustainable budget for this year, 2018-19, as it says there. And then through the budget setting process, um, you know, so that it's more open and transparent for not just members, but members of the public as well. And just maybe, and could I maybe ask if, if that was an appropriate way to do things uh, to the finance officer, if that's acceptable? Uh, Paul, I, I do have a suggestion on that, but Paul. Yes, if that's members' choice, that absolutely can be accommodated. The, the recommendation was in the report is for a recurring application of funding or, or to seek a recurring application of funding because they are sustainable underlying issues we're trying to address rather than non-recurring issues. However, if that's members' uh, preferred approach, then that absolutely, yes, can be accommodated. Uh, Malcolm. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, mean, I share uh, Stephen's views on this. I think to have a, re a recurring allocation of 552,000 uh, wouldn't be the, the proper approach, I don't think. I think as a one-off thing, that's fine. But I think going forward, we need to have a sustainable and proper, properly set budget, taking into account all these other factors. And given the amount of change that's about to hit EEI going forward, I think it's, it's time to really address the budget setting issue rather than just having a recurring grant. I think, obviously, one of the issues we've got to request back to PNR for, for, for the budget, and, and one of the things I'm going to do is rec change the recommendation slightly that will hopefully satisfy what your uh, request is, Katie. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, just in reference to the road services on page 27, it makes mention of the agreed commercial development plan. Now, I'm aware that we've got the business plan in front of us with our committee here today, and it's just to get clarification that we are, in fact, getting 
the revised plan back to Enterprising Sub. I believe we're meeting on the 2nd of October. And just to confirm that once that has gone to Enterprising Sub, it will then come back to EEI on the 20th to be approved. Is that correct? It's just for yeah, I'm, I'm looking at uh, Ronnie Dempster across here and he's shaking his head. Yes, it's coming back to Enterprising DNG on the 2nd of October and it will come back to EEI to be approved after that. Alistair, do you want to add anything? Yes, it, it's coming back to the next uh, report, uh, ne the next meeting of the, the subcommittee uh, with the, the requested KPIs and information that members asked for. Uh, and, and as the Chair says, it will then uh, come back to EEI for approval. Richard and then David. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, like Councillor Thompson was going to refer to 1.2, it says the, this report is closely linked to the preceding report. Obviously, the preceding report is now following this report. Uh, uh, I'll just refer to the £522,000. All right, OK, I, I think it's been a bit short-sighted saying we we'll ask policy and resources about that because at the end of this, for next year and the following years, this uh, committee will have to save its share of the £40 million pound which pressures which we have. Uh, so I'd just like insurance that we are looking at to see how we can we can bridge that gap, that we are trying all we can to bridge the gap in this 552,000. Paul? Yes, I mean, the exercise that's been undertaken by the EI management team is outlined uh, in the bullets at the, the top of page 26 of your papers and, and what, the, what they've done is seek to minimise any request for corporate support on either a recurring or non-recurring basis. The, the overspend returned in financial year 2017-18 was over 950,000 so there has been a, a significant reduction in the level of pressure presented in this report and the subsequent request to policy and resources for corporate support. That will absolutely be an ongoing process as you've recognised the council needs to achieve £40 million pounds worth of savings or bring forward £40 million pounds worth of savings options over the next two financial years. As an unprotected service, as has done up to now, EI will have to contribute a significant element of those savings. So that, that search for savings and need for ongoing efficiencies is something, it's something that we'll be looking at on an ongoing basis. Okay. David? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not 100% sure whether the um, disappointing performance of the enterprising services, um, their £771,000 worse performance than expected, contributes to this 552 shortfall. But in the end, it's got to be paid per, by the council. So the GOM meeting that we had at the um, subcommittee handling um, DG enterprising services. Um, for me, it wasn't so glum because they, they stopped talking about catering for Carlisle and resurfacing Ayrshire. And I know there's no appetite to actually abandon um, enterprising services, but I, I would welcome it if the future is a sort of running, gentle running down and getting getting rid of that um, concept because it uh, seems losing money at the moment, but fraught with risk and um, not a thing we need to be um, involved with. Um. I'm not sure whether that's a pertinent question for this actual, this is this, this United, it's maybe something you want to raise at EDG, um, David. Um, I'm, I don't agree with your um, overview of enterprise and D&G. Um, maybe Sean, you want to yeah. come back and... Uh, David raised this uh, um, and it was not competent to actually raise it at the subcommittee. And I did give him some advice. If he, if he does want to kind of mount that kind of attack on a service, then should really get the support of his own group first, which he doesn't even appear to have. So it was basically not, uh, not competent. OK, members, so we will go to, uh, unless there's anybody else, um, we'll go to the recommendations then. So we've been asked to note 2.1. With regards 2.2, I think wording uh, to agree to submit a request to PNR committee for the application of up to 552K to provide a sustainable budget for EEI for financial year 1819, and this should be considered a budget setting process to ensure baseline budgets are correct for future years. Sorry, Chair, it's maybe just me. I thought at PNR last week we agreed up to, Stephen emphasised the point, up to £552,000. 
it's almost retrospective. I may be picking it up wrong. No, we, we've maybe got to go back to policy and resources and ask for it. Oh, I thought we'd agreed then. So that's my mistake then. I thought we agreed up to 552. That's my mistake. I'm, I'm right in saying that we... Um, that's what I said there, Ian, up, up to 552k. Um, uh, it has to go back to PNR as a request from E&I, is that correct? Yes, PNR committee have set aside the funding, but that's pending request coming back from, from this committee. So that will be brought forward to PNR at the November meeting. Stephen? So, um, but I, I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, what we're actually doing is asking for exactly 552k. So this committee is effectively asking PNR for 550. So we can take out the up to, I think. Okay, take out the up to. So then that will be a great submit a request to PNR committee for the application of 552 to provide a sustainable budget for ENI for financial year 1819. This should be considered a budget setting process to ensure baseline budgets are correct for future years. I'm happy with that. Excellent. And then we have to note 2.3. Have we agreed there? Thank you very much. And then we go back to item 5, which is the Economy, Environment, Infrastructure, Revenue, Budget, Monitoring Report 2018-19 for the period ended um, 30th of June 2018. This report provides members with an overview of key budget monitoring issues and projected performance against budget for the current financial year based on the position as 30th June 2018. This report is linked to the previous report on the agenda which outlines the detailed budget for 2018-19. Important to note that this report assumes that the recommendations of the previous report are agreed and they are agreed. The director and his management team will take any questions on the report unless you've got anything to add, director. Uh, nothing to add at this stage. Paul. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I've got two questions, really. One of them is in regards to enterprising services, where we've, it's reported that we have an overspend of 34,000, but in the narrative on 4.2, it references 25. So I was just wondering where the 9K difference is. So that was my first question. And my second question was in relation to the planning department. Now, we, we got lots of information back at our last committee, or two committees previous, excuse me, about the budget and the deficit and the actual spend. The figures that were given in that committee don't appear to be in this, and it's just, I'm not, I'm looking for clarity really, the, and it's a request really that we can have clear, clear information presented to us because it's you know, it's difficult to scrutinise when there's such confusion with numbers and when there's been a report previously that identifies a deficit and there's figures being presented. If those figures aren't then reported in the next report, it becomes quite muddy. So it's just a, it's a plea for some clarity really on this because obviously we need to be able to understand it fully really to scrutinise it. But again, so do the members of the public. So it's sort of two questions there. Paul. Yes, thanks, Chair. Uh, on, on the first question, the reason for the, the slightly higher level of uh, potential overspend reported against the enterprise and services than covered in the narrative is there's a small £9,000 £9, pressure in relation to vehicle costs at central stores, which we're currently trying to, to address. On the, the planning fees issues, I, I absolutely understand what you're saying. What I would, what would say is that the budget for planning and regulatory services has been realigned in line with the details in the previous report. What we're saying is there's a small variance against that realigned budget we're reflecting here. But happy maybe to speak to you further about ensuring we get that clarity going forward just to make sure we're addressing those concerns. Okay. Rose Malcolm. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just looking at page 21, and I note, as previously, um, the figure against Dromore Harbour is 17,000. And um, I have um, looked at previous committee reports where the money was 27,000, and I wonder if it could be clarified how much we have set aside for Dromore and where that money went. Thanks. Also? Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Uh, on the Dromore Harbour, we, we, we had a service reserve. We set up a reser service reserve some time ago uh, to, to cover the legal aspects of providing harbour orders uh, going forward with the harbour. Now, that, that was at that time. Uh, 
committee agreed that if, if there was any any demand on that money in relation to, to, to legal matters, that we could support uh, the local community in trying to uh, take control of the harbour, uh, then that would be done. And over the years, uh, £20,000 has been drawn down to address legal fees that have been received in relation to helping the community. Uh, not all of the 20 was used for legal fees and the balance was used to, to help our action plan that we put in place last year for the revenue account, which members will recall. So we have £17,000 hard cash left in that reserve and my understanding uh, is that there are a couple of bills still to come in uh, uh, legally uh, that will be charged against that. I don't know how much these are for at this stage. Uh, and I also understand that there's a meeting with the Trust uh, and, and Rona Lewis uh, very soon, uh, where they will discuss the next steps and uh, any, any help or assistance we can give with the legal aspects, uh, then I'm sure we'll do that. Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's on 4.1, Infrastructure and Transportation. Paragraph down at the bottom of that section about uh, an assumption of rental income of £150,000 per annum for depots. Um, I, would I would like to know how, how that's progressing and how likely we are to achieve this £150,000 rental income. Ronnie. Thank you, Chair. Um, discussions and negotiations are currently still ongoing with uh, Scotland Transserve in relation to the utilisation of depots. Uh, and I think at this time, while we are in the sort of final final stages of that, I think it's very positive, uh, and I have no reason not to suggest that we will hit the anticipated target that's within the report. Uh, will, that, will that be £150,000 for the year, or if they're going to rent them for six months, is it going to be £75,000? How's, how's that going to work, the phasing of it? Right. Again, through you, Chair, that's based on the uh, anticipation of their winter season. So it will be uh, to cover their winter season through to uh, May uh, uh, next year. Okay. Nobody else? We'll go to the recommendations then. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Thank you, Chair, for letting me come back in. It was just to clarify. On the service reserves, we've got under the local development plan to prepare the LDP2 for the deadline. Now, obviously, that was agreed at full council to go forward. Is that reserve being utilised now, or is that reserve still there? Because if it's not been utilised, my understanding is it's now gone to Scottish Government. Will that then go into next year's budget? Caroline, anything? Home? Here he comes to save the day. <laughs> Chair, yes, uh, thank you. The, that service reserve at the moment has not been used, but it will be required to pay for the cost of the examination process for LDP2. Okay, have it. Okay, okay. And other members will go to the recommendations. And members were asked to note 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3. Okay, thank you very much. We'll now go on to item number seven, which is back in line with the rest of the agenda. <coughs> uh, this is the Infrastructure Capital Programme and Street Lighting Spent to Save Programme 2018-19 Finance and Progress Monitoring Report. The report provides members with a financial progress update for the projects and programmes contained within the 2018-19 Capital Programmes for Infrastructure, including the Street Lighting Spent to Save Programme, Excellent news that a further 455,000 has been drawn down from Strategic Timber Transport Fund in the most recent round of awards, which is a paragraph 3.14, provide detail there. And it is requested by members, a briefing paper has been included at Appendix 3 on speeding and speed limits, which was asked for at the last E&I committee. Uh, the Head of Infrastructure and Transportation will take any questions on the report, unless you've got anything to add, Director. Nothing to add at this stage, Chair. Thank you. David, you declared an interest on this item, did you? No? It was just for clarity for the clerk. Okay, members, any questions? 
Malcolm, and then Katie, then Richard. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just looking at page 55, uh, and like most members, I'm sure, one of the, one of the biggest uh, things we get contacted about is uh, road repairs issues, and I see some quite chunky variances on carriageway surface dressing, planned structural overlays. Um, is there a reason for that? Is uh, the work's not been carried out for whatever reason, and will, the, will this work then continue if there has been problems? Uh, because, like I say, it's something we all get a lot of lot of correspondence about. So I would I would like a wee bit of reassurance that this uh, these works are actually going to take place. Steve. Yeah. So uh, Appendix One's reporting the agreed budget, the spend date, and the predicted outturn, and the variance is shown there on the predicted outturn against the agreed budget. Um, what the predicted outturn doesn't for a, a number of these programmes is it's not picking up everything that's committed or, 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 or sorry, it's not yet committed, but will come forward. The likes of some of the planned structural overlays work, we tend to plan that later on in the year. It's an activity we tend to do as we move into the winter and then pick up some of the, the winter, the post-winter damage as well. Uh, so these works take place later. On, on the surface dressing, we're reporting that that programme is complete because that's an activity that happens through uh, early summer and, and, and into the summer. Uh, there is a bit of an underspend there. We will, what we will do there is we will chase the cost through and uh, get that figure tied down just to see what the underspend is. We did drop uh, about four projects on that because of coordination with utilities, uh, meaning that we would have done the work and the utilities would have come in afterwards and actually put tracks through our work. So we delay those projects and we brought a couple of projects forward quickly. On the surface dressing, it's probably more difficult to accelerate projects unless we've planned for them because we tend to do pre-patching works uh, in advance a number of months before. So anything in the underspend in the surface dressing works, we will, we, will, we will plow back into the other carriageway programmes. We will also get additional commitments in for the, the two other programmes on the carriageways, the planned structural overlays and the, uh, the carriageway drainage. We'll get those figures up. What we're aiming to do um, to avoid the kind of underspend scenario is is over. Uh, we would aim to overcommit on the capital programmes is what we tend to do uh, so that when we, we have issues like we did last year with weather in the last quarter, we try to minimise the underspend. Um, so we will, we will chase through those programmes uh, and aim uh, because of the underspend, particularly last year, and the carry forward uh, that we're programming, the overcommitment this year that we're programming into next year. Uh, there is the potential for us to overcommit and to draw some of that funding back into this financial year if we can complete all the works. Okay, and you, Katie, then Richard, and then Rose. Thank you, Chair. And I think there's a lot of really good positive things in this report, so I'd just like to thank officers for their hard work. I want to specifically note the Strone Bridge, which I brought up, that there was issues with the mortar, and that has been um, completed, the remedial works, and has no extra cost, so that's fantastic news, and it's really good to get... a that the Garliston Harbour Wall remedial works, we're moving forward with those projects because those are issues that have been reported specifically to me and it's fantastic to see that we're actually getting on with those. In terms of the Newton-Stewart flood protection scheme that's mentioned in 3.29, it's just a question as to when are the community likely to see some designs as we, as we move forward with that. And I've also been approached at Community Council about our street lighting and whether there's an option that we can switch off the street light at night, say between midnight and 4pm, it's been raised to me that we're in, a, we're in a dark skies park, and obviously we've got these new LED lights which are not light polluting, but the question was raised to me, so I just wanted to ask officers if that's ever been considered, because I said I would. Okay. Right, so, can you show? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the... the, the uh, the positive comments on the report, Council Hagman. Uh, with regards to the Newton Stewart Flood Protection Scheme, um, as the report says, we, we'd hope to come forward earlier uh, to this committee, and we've slipped that back until um, later. Um, so I would see that over the next over this next period, we would be uh, between now and when we go to publish the order, uh, we would obviously want to do further consultation with the community. Um, that that'll, so that will be before the end of the year. Um, with regards to the street right street light inquiry. Um, we at present dim the lights from midnight, so all lights across the region are dimmed from midnight till five in the morning to reduce energy costs. Um, so we haven't yet moved to an approach to, to turn lights off. Um, 
I think that would be quite a significant step forward and one that will receive some positive and some negative. And at present, uh, we've we've received a lot of positive on the uh, on the lighting, and maybe we haven't made people aware that actually to keep costs down, we're, we are automatically dimming all our LEDs, all twenty two thousand of them across the region at night time. Okay. Okay. Richard, then Rose, then Sean, and then David and Stephen. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. There's no point in moaning about the potholes. They're all there, we know that. And uh, page 67, the footways budget, there's a very small programme there. Uh, and we're getting to the stage now where some of our pavements are, are deterring older people from going on the road because if they want to get the shops in, it is, it is a bit of trek if the, if the surfaces are uneven. Uh, we can challenge, though, how we spend our budget. And I would like to challenge how we're spending part of the budget on page 46, 3.19. We're, we're, we're asked to agree to put some more mo to money into a car park. Could that money be spent put, put to the ro to roads or to pavements? I, I would challenge that then. It says, to due to significant surface deterioration, in addition to the car parks program, is the resurfacing of the Lorburn Lesser Hall car park. Uh, on my way to here today, I've, I've noticed... Uh, Past major roads, important roads with significant surface deterioration. Perhaps we should be spending the money on that because uh, the speed limit, in a, well, the speed you go in a car, a car park is a lot less than the roads, and therefore less likely to damage your car. So uh, I would, I would, I would suggest that we consider uh, consider that matter. We, we've got a, we've got the request for the money, but it doesn't say how much it's, it's going to cost. Uh, the lesser hall, lesser hall car park to do. I mean, I, th I think the the works has been agreed here at EANI, and you were part of that, Richard. Then and you, you'll know what was actually in those particular parts of works. But if you could ask the answer the, the sort of questions that Richard's been asking. So, so the item at 3.19, the Lordburn Lesser Hall car park, was actually uh, was in the program last year. Plan plan to do those works. Um, in terms of the, the comments the council is making about the the various parts of the, the infrastructure, and it is for this committee to decide how to allocate uh, against the capital programmes. Uh, on uh, in, in terms of the programmes that we present, these are you know based on our inspections, based on kind of risk assessments, uh, on the safety inspections, and judgments are made about the kind of condition and the deterioration in car parks, uh, as well as footways, as well as carriageways, and we try we're trying to maintain all these asset groups. Uh, footways are important, yet we, don't, we want to avoid trip hazards, we want to avoid uh, uh, deterioration and defects that, that can cause problems uh, with, the, with the mobility impaired, and we would, we would certainly aim to do that uh, within our footways programme. Uh, it has fluctuated over the years, it's probably one of those programmes that we, we adjust to try and put more money into, into carriageway uh, resurfacing works, um, as, as we've reported to this committee. But I would think it's still important that we, we continue to invest in our car parks in terms of the the benefits that they bring uh, for for, for uh, uh, town centre access, uh, and also to, to you know to maintain safe car parking uh, facilities. There is, there is a point where, uh, probably less so with footways, but a, a level of deterioration in a car park, as 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 with a carriageway, a road surface, if we let it go too far, uh, the, the the remedial costs can probably accelerate. Uh, and in in, in a kind of the, the best scenario would be that we would continue with preventative maintenance and all these assets. But we do tend to make a, a judgment on trying to balance uh, the capital funding that is available uh, to maintain everything uh, within our portfolio. Come back. Yeah, the, you didn't mention the, the budget co cost we've got in our budget for it, but we have been asked for the first time to mm -hmm. support this this funding this year. So it's up to members really to say, well, we don't want to we don't want to spend the money in the car park. We want to allocate it elsewhere. So. Uh, uh, Richard, that's um, already been agreed. Not in this. Not going to this. It's, it says it's the work will be undertaken within existing budget. Sorry, sorry. Right. Stephen? So I'm, I'm just being advised it was, it was in a programme that was agreed for last year, uh, but it was, was taken out and, and has, has moved into this year's programme. And we've just brought it back in again. So it has been before members before, but for... Uh, probably reasons of funding uh, wasn't wasn't undertaken last year. Okay, um, I've got a few members who to come in, so Rog and then Sean. Thank you very much, Chair. 
Um, yeah, it's really good to see um, such positive work happening and moving forward um, in, in lots of ways. Um, I'm just looking at um, page 47, item 3.26, regarding the terms and conditions for the harbour use at Stranra. And I wondered if it would be possible for members to see the terms and conditions for harbour use um, and related terms and conditions. James. <laughs> Chair, uh, Councillor Sturge, uh, absolutely no problem at all. We will share those. Uh, we can share them with the committee straight after. We can share them with Harbour Users Group. We can share them with our local members. Okay, okay. thank you, Sean. Thanks, Chair. Um, first of all, really, Appendix 2, just to commend the report format. Format. I think it's a diff this is a new format, so um, I think it's a lot better than, than the previous one. Um, it's just in relation, first of all, in page 70, um, I've been following the, the program, and I've noticed that the um, Port Street, the C36, is in twice. Uh, the, first, the first one is that the work has already been done, and that's between Glebe uh, Junction and the railway bridge. I did report to the roads manager, though, that there was a, there's a gap between uh, phase one that was done a couple of years ago and phase two. So I'm wondering if that, the work further down there um, is, is being brought forward from the reserve, or is it an actual fact um, have we brought forward phase three, which would take it from the railway bridge down to the harbour? I have emailed the, the roads manager, but I haven't received any response. Um, that was a couple of weeks ago. So just if you could clarify that either offline, you know, by email. And, and the last thing, just picking up on something Stephen said, I think it would be useful is because members, we do get bombarded with people asking why this road's done before another road, why this portal's done, this one's left, etc. And I'm just wondering if you could, you actually refer to the inspection regimes, etc. and the policy document documents. And I wonder if you can maybe send the links to all um, elected members, just the links on these policy documents so that we can explain to our constituents, you know, you know the reason why you know, a certain road or a certain footway has been done and explain the, the inspection regime. Okay. Okay, well, we'll, we'll check the C36 and the double entry there uh, and, and, and get some clarification back to you by email, Councillor Marshall. Uh, and we can certainly, we can send a link to our, our in safety, safety inspection guidelines, which does tend to inform, safety inspection guidelines tends to inform more the reactive repairs that we, we, we fund out of the revenue budget uh, rather than the capital program investment, uh, which which is a different process, looking at the kind of the larger schemes uh, and the need to uh, arrest deterioration. Okay, thank you, David. Then Stephen. Then Ian. Thank you, Chair. Um, as my friend Malcolm pointed out, there are recurring issues that uh, come before all of us, and uh, one of them is uh, speeding in villages. And uh, at a recent um, community council meeting I attended, we were told by the police lady about uh, community speed watch. And um, everybody was very excited about this chance they might get to get some equipment and measure speeding within their village and, and report the results and uh, with a view to action being taken later down the, the, the piece. But um, finally, she said, there's a big but, and it's going to cost, um, I can't remember, low, in the low thousands to get one of these uh, machines and set up and do it. And um, because all or most community councils, in my experience, um, feel that they would like access to this type of facility. Um, would it be a, a gesture that we could make uh, to support the public in the campaign against speeding through villages by purchasing one or two of these um, sets that they could be rotated uh, through communities? Or uh, I don't know what your opinion is, Chair. If it was a good idea, or perhaps it's something for the area committees to look at. But I think it's uh, you know I think it would be very welcome, and is probably out with an individual community council to do, but well within the scope of the council to do. Yeah, Alistair. Uh, yeah, well, uh, we want communities to get involved, uh, there's no doubt about it, but I think what we have to be clear is, as a roads authority, we're not a, a, a regulatory authority when it comes to speeds, it's the police who regulate the speeds, and, and, and this particular scheme has very much been organised with the police, rather than with ourselves, because the police give them uh, give them advice uh, on their own safety because uh, being no doubt some drivers in road rage etc there's always the danger uh, when a member of public is is holding one of these uh, guns or whatever uh, it may be construed uh, in a different fashion so 
let me speak, uh, I'll take your request on and speak to the police through, through the, the Road Safety Partnership uh, and I'll report back to you. I think from my own op opinion on this, there are some community councils who have already done this and the problem is, is that some of the people who drive and it's driving behaviour that we're looking at here rather than is, is speed and, and, and try to catch people is that when individuals who are known within the community, they do tend to get a lot of hassle off, off of drivers. Um, I think Alistair is right, it's done through the police and hopefully the police will be there when they actually do the, the, the speed checking and things like that. But I'd be very wary of, of, of you know, the, the issues of driver abuse um, for individuals and, and that's a behavioural issue that we can't put a policy on at the moment, I'm afraid. Um, we've now got um, Stephen and Ian. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, just uh, to echo Councillor Marshall, I think the uh, report is much clearer to read in terms of the, the, the projects that we're actually doing, so, um, uh, so praise is due. Um, but there's just a couple of things to do with um, 3.51. Uh, obviously, there's a bit of work there being done uh, in conjunction with uh, SUSTRANS for a number of projects, but just to sort of see if there's any progress on the BTIC to Moffat path, uh, cycleway that's been mentioned there, given that there's, um, you know, maybe there's a sort of a, a movement in the funding that we need to provide given the previous uh, element in terms of the Dumfries uh, route to the hospital, uh, and if there's any update on that. And similarly, in 3.53, um, and this is to do with, uh, again, active travel, um, but Alexandra Drive in Lockerbie, which is referenced as part of programmed works and allocated a budget. Um, I know we're not getting into ward issues here, but it's uh, the general principle of active travel. Um, so uh, it's really just to see um, how ward members can be involved in that, given that there was no clear uh, outcome to the consultation, uh, and I presume that we kept up to date with that. But the, the, the sort of attached thing with that is um, the AIP. Uh, you'll see that there's a, a, a section where uh, the community councils, etc., and other people can sort of put forward um, uh, or suggest things that we would then consider under a sort of a community-based uh, project for sort of safety. And I'm just, I, I very much welcome that. I think it's just really, what, how does that mechanism work and how will they get prioritised? Because I think it's going to ultimately come down to priorities and budgets. But I noticed there is a programme there for Anne and I think an AIP one in the listed reports. So it's really just to understand a bit better how community councils who do raise these issues but often feel that they're not getting onto the, the list of um, programmes. Uh, so it's how, how will that actually money be good, Steve? Yep, thank you, Councillor, for that. Um, with regards to the BTIC Moffat, the uh, application to Sustrans has been submitted and uh, they're reviewing the application at the moment and we hope at the end of the month to get the, get the funding secured for the, for the feasibility study, um, which will involve a lot of consultation and engagement with uh, not only the ward officer, but the local local community and, and bodies in, in Moffat. So, uh, that's sort of due to probably start in uh, October. With regards to Alexandra Drive, yeah, I think I mentioned there was a, a few options were proposed. Ourselves in Police Scotland had thought of one option, and I think uh, yourself and some others came back with another option, so we thought we'd just take that away and reassess it, maybe have another site visit. And uh, I think there was an issue there. There was some land owned by DGHP that were just a bit worried uh, it, it could could complicate matters, so that's still on on the programme, and we'll we'll get on to that uh, quite soon. Uh, with regards to the AIP, I think Annan was mentioned because there was two schemes in Annan identified because of the uh, those three injury accidents in the last three years uh, within a 50 metre radius, one at the junction of the B724 and 721. Um, and there is mitigation measures, <clears throat> some modifications to the existing signage being implemented. The other accident hotspot was in the town centre, and we reviewed those accidents with the police, and there was no sort of common causation between the three accidents that we could actually do anything. Uh, there was like cars reversing, one hit a pedestrian, caused um, uh, an injury. I think another was just uh, someone getting rear-ended, led to whiplash. So there was, there was no particular location. So we only had two sites identified in, in this year's AIP. So what we've said is 
we'll, we'll take a step <laughs> back from that criteria. If there's, say, two injury accidents in an area, we'll look at that. And we've also opened it up to um, any communities or elected members that, that think there's a potential location. We're more than happy to, to go out, do a site visit, and, and work with, with anyone to see if there's any mitigation measures we can, we can uh, produce. Michael Mark. No, uh, no, thanks very much. I mean, that, it does help clarify for the first two items in particular. I think it was, uh, I mean, in 3.38, it sort of outlines, it's, it's really just the potential schemes will also be considered from locations reported by the public community councils, and that's what you've just touched on there. Um, obviously, the, the, I suppose what I'm trying to get at is how often communities will have a perception of um, what an issue might be, and that very much affects their uh, amenity, if you like, in terms of the... the the public feeling about the safety of the, ro the road in their community. Now, that might not always be as robustly supported by uh, evidence of incidents or you know, um, fatalities, for example. Uh, yet, the concern remains nevertheless. So I think that, it, and obviously that will be prioritised more uh, lower uh, accordingly because it's harder to justify, I suppose, but yet the concern remains nevertheless. And it comes up again and again year after year. So I think it's, does this mean there is a way for us to actually with some degree of discretion and funding permitted, etc., recognise that where it's a perpetual and persistent concern, and there might not be um, a notice in the the briefing note, which is very welcome in terms of the speeding, but it does set a 50 metre radius um, in terms of uh, the criteria for injury accidents. Now, in some rural communities, that might be 100 metres where there's actually a, a cluster, or 200 metres where that could affect the community's perception of safety. So. How rigidly would we stick to that, and what, what kind of flexibility is there within this new initiative? Well, I think that's what I mentioned there, that because there was only two specific AIP ones that, that, that met the full criteria, we're quite happy to relax that criteria. And if it does mean look at a wider area, we had a meeting recently with Police Scotland, and they identified two sites, one near Beeswing and one near Moffat, where there has been a number of uh, accidents, uh, damage, some injury, but maybe over a five, six year period, and it didn't fit the, the three injury in the three year period. So we are looking at those. Um, so I think in, in the first instance, any concerns you do have, by all means, please, please send them to me. Um, we can review them. Uh, I will say that, yes, we do have to give priority, and that's usually based on the, the accident statistics or if there is speeding issues or if it's already been in the programme. But but I, I do treat all these um, reports, requests um, seriously, and I think the clue's in the title as well, it's Accident Investigation and Prevention. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ian, and then Richard, and then Katie. Just briefly, Chair, for myself, in regards to the same as some of the previous members I mentioned, Appendix 2, I think it's, it's good. So 2.2, we've been asked to agree that 3.5 outlines uh, that's exactly what I look to agree. I just I think additional information on that would be helpful for myself. And that's approximate questions in regards to the, the programmes, either programmes or completed works. That would make it just one more line in there, Chairman, if we could maybe consider that when we get to the recommendations. I think it's certainly a, a, a great improvement in regards to what we've had, but it just helps you give an understanding of the spending profile, how it's rolling on, how it's being completed as the year goes on, as, as it's been reported. So if we, if we get the approximate questions in there as well, that would be much appreciated, Chair. Steve, would that be something you could do? If, if it's an instruction of the committee, yes, we, we can do that. We've tended to, and I think we've discussed this a number of times, we've tended not to provide values against the projects. Uh, we, 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 we're trying to avoid the situation where we can, we can or, or, or look at, see that a particular locality is maybe over, or, you know, or has, has, has a lot of funding in a particular area allocated to it. Our, our approach really is one of the kind of the best practice uh, asset management approach in terms of we want to fund where the, the works are most needed at that time and whether that's addressing a safety issue or whether that's addressing you know, an intervention now that can reduce maintenance costs later. Um, Their information is there in terms of estimates. It, it tends to be flexible as we go in and we look closer at schemes. We, can, we, we, we adjust the extents of those schemes as we find further defects and look at what the kind of optimal scheme size is. It probably evolves uh, through, through, through the year. Uh, but if it, I mean, it's... We've discussed this before. The information can be made available. It's been made available out with committee uh, in the past, or it could be put in the committee reports, depending on what the, the committee uh, requires of us. So, so if there's any specific 
um, request for a, for a member for costings of a specific scheme that could be emailed to the, the member. Would you be happy with that, Ian? It's myself that keeps bringing this one up, Chairman. I think I'd rather be open and transparent. It's not about having exact costings. I wouldn't want to prejudice the Council in any way in regards to... We agree, actually. We have approximate, uh, we have approximate costings back in March. And going back to the reference earlier, we've agreed these previously, some of the, the, the program uh, works that are in this program. But I think for this, we start to develop and see it coming through. We see this information anyways. Approximate costings, not exact, but some it gives an indication of what the spending profile is. And it is across... Steve has maybe picked up on a... Might be seen as a parochial point, but I don't think it is. I think it's for elected members to see how much money is getting spent in Andale, Estale, Nisdale, Shirley, Wigdonshire, even broke down at their own ward if they want to see that level of profile spend. It's, we can get it out with the committee. I don't see any reason why it's not just incorporated within the committee report. I mean, the only concern I would have, of course, is that prices of material fluctuates, and it's going to fluctuate even more as we get forward to this Brexit side of things. Um, and, and that initial um, I'm trying to think of the best word for you. The initial sort of costings on it may fluctuate that much, but then members will hold officers to account on you said this was going to cost this much, but you do get the fluctuation in there. Chairman, no, thanks for your comments, but that's why I specifically used the word approximate costing. So nobody's been held to account in regards to that. It gives us, it just gives an approximation and we're being open and transparent with the public and actually we can see ourselves as members. Well, here's how much we're spending in Wigdonshire. Stuart in this deal, and the LNS deal, as per our agreed formula that we've agreed at committee for a number of years now. Director? Uh, I think we need to just, just consider that. We, we don't do it by an agreed formula. We, we do it by, by need. Can that be confirmed? What, what, what we tend to do in terms of the capital programme, it's on the basis of, of generally on the basis of need uh, across, if, if we have, need, you know, if there's a an urgency in a, a particular area, uh, the, then the capital programme will, will flex to adjust that. What we tend to do, the historic allocation is probably more related to the revenue maintenance budget uh, for the road service. Uh, and in the past, certainly, there was a, there was a, a weighted road length allocation uh, across a number of the, uh, the items in that to, to, to division the, the, the budget out uh, to local areas. Okay, thank you. We've got Richard, then Katie, then Stephen, did you want to come back in? All right, make that point then. Um, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I would quite welcome seeing costs rather than have to get individual emails. However, I understand that um, there's going to be a difference between the programmed and the allocation of budget at the start of the year, but the completed projects, we will have a final cost on what they actually cost, which, you know, which will not be subject to variation. So I can see that during programming or procurement, if it's, you know, there's maybe uh, delicacies or negotiations that have to happen there or just the cost of materials, etc. But once a job's completed, it will have a final bill. So, I mean, would it not make sense just to... Just coming back to your point, Ian, would you be happy with it? Where the completed part is, having the cost of that, but obviously the discussions that may be happening with contractors, things like that, be, be subject, would you be happy with that? Absolutely, Chairman. I think that's a fair point. I had thought of that myself anyways, and that's why I didn't want to prejudice, and I used the word approximation, but I think if, if that's a way forward, absolutely, if it's completed, works. But I, don't, I mean, I think it's right for the sake of procurement and getting the best benefits in regards to that, we shouldn't be telling uh, any potential contract, uh, contractor, whether it's even in-house, but delivery, but how much we've got to spend on a particular job, but it makes their job very easy. Okay, thank you. Richard? Yeah, it was on the specific point, but, uh, but to make a decision today on the car park, we need that figure. So p perhaps we could give that figure before we decide whether it's worth making making an alteration to the recommendations. But that wasn't the point. I was asked following this one. Uh, it was on the 20 mile an hour zones. Uh, it's another council priority that we move towards 20 mile an hour within the Friesen Galloway. And I did ask for a report back to see how we could we could uh, move what. What our plan is to move towards that to introduce it to, to roll it out we have got a report on it which is very good very good on that uh, the but it's still stuck in the with past policies it doesn't refer to the fact that we made in the the council plan a priority so i think we should be more proactive in this one what is our plan for over the next four years to, to start rolling out 20 mil an hour zone through the through the through the, the region. Uh, I don't think we should be waiting for this, the Scottish Parliament to introduce it. We should be making plans now how we're going to actually go about it so that we're ready, 
ready to, to move forward. So what is our plan? What is our plan in 20 miles in our zones? Because it doesn't seem that we've got a real plan to do that. I mean, we did respond to a consultation on 20 mile per hour zones not that long back. Um, and COSLA have actually taken things forward with Scottish Parliament on that side of things as well. Um, I think we need to wait and see what the, the view actually says. I know that, for instance, last week at the APSI conference, there was some councils down south who are having problems with the 20 mile an hour zones. Not because they're, 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 they're actually safer, it's because some of the older vehicles, which are diesel, are actually in increasing their emissions because they're in a lower lower gear. But I think, can, can we get clarity where we are with that, Director? Yes, Chair, Th thank you. I, I, I think we're just waiting for confirmation from the Scottish Government what their final decisions are uh, on this to see what scope and additional scope it gives us. But uh, I accept that uh, we don't have a clear plan at the moment. We, we have a policy that sets out our priorities and schools come top of that list and we're working our way through that. We still are. Uh, I think it would be appropriate to come back with a paper to members uh, or, or on, that, on that way forward. Once you get the response from yeah. Scottish Parliament. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Katie. Sorry, just, just to come back to Councillor Brodie's question on the value of the car park. We've just uh, interrogated the spreadsheets where we have all the costs. It's, uh, it's approximately uh, £24,000 cost for the Lord Burn Lesser Hall car park. Okay, thank you. Um, Katie, uh, then Jim, and then Jeff. Thank you, Chair, for letting me come back in on these. Um, I just wanted to I congratulate the team on the on the good work that they've done in terms of the harbours. But I just wanted to actually um, highlight the good work that the environment team have been done. We've got a lot, uh, lots of recommendations to note and agree, but actually I'm wondering whether there's an, there's an opportunity to add a further recommendation to note the good work of the environment team, because the environment team have been bringing in huge amounts of funding to the department in terms of their core path network and well, it's listed on here from 3.56. I'm very fortunate to be able to sit on the Outdoor Access Forum where we get a regular update from the Countryside Development Officer, Brian Scott, who is extremely open and transparent. And also, there's really exciting funding bids going in, which we're waiting to find out. And actually, it's just to acknowledge the really positive work that that team does on an extremely small staff. So I just wanted to have that noted in the committee and actually yeah. if that information could be passed back to the we'll, team. We'll come to that during the recommendation. Thank okay. you. Okay, Jim. Thanks, Chair. There's a very useful briefing paper here, Chair, on speeding and speed limits. Would it be appropriate for that briefing paper to be passed on to community councils? Um, Director. I don't think I have any issue with that. I'd be delighted to do that and, and we'll, we'll arrange for email circulation of that. Okay. Reaction plan, that'll be Jeff and then Sean. <coughs> thank, thank you, Chair. Not wishing to be uh, parochial, but uh, touching on the 20 mile an hour zone, I see that the uh, 20 mile an hour blanket uh, zone for Heath Hall is now programmed. Is that a recent movement? I know uh, Tony met with uh, members of the uh, the Community Council and TISM, which they've actively been pursuing for many years, I'm aware of. Yeah, it's very recent. We had a meeting with uh, Heath Hall Community Council last week. We had the results of the recent speed survey, and there was a few roads that recently got resurfaced and they had the speed humps uh, removed. So we actually, the, the, the mean speeds on some of these roads are below the 24 mile an hour threshold. Um, and a lot of the roads that are still 30 in Heath Hall are actually just uh, cul-de-sacs. So without too much financial implications, uh, we're going to propose a blanket 20 with the exception of Astor Drive, which is the sort of main uh, distributor road into Heath Hall, which still has mean speeds of, I think, 28 miles an hour. So we'll keep that as 30. So it'll be quite a straightforward uh, sign signing exercise. To, to create a, a blanket zone, and then we'll monitor that as a sort of pilot area for the for the rest of the region. Thank you, Sean. And then finally, Ian, because I've got the recommendations after that. Thanks, Chair. Just a point of information um, for Graham and Stephen. I've just received an email from Gillian 
Nelson and Stuart Caven, just to confirm that the Port Street, the additional part, is indeed the part that was missed between phase one and phase two. So that's the reason why that part's on. It was originally missed, but it was you know, it's something that was reported. So that's great. Thanks. Congratulations on that quick response, um, Ian. Be very brief, Chief uh, Chair, and thanks for your uh, patience. Uh, just it's page 52. I thought you, I wasn't sure if you've got to bring it up yourself, but the Glentaris landslip. I just thought to recognise, I mean, that, it looks certainly in the face it to be good progress. I just wonder, it's, it does talk about the contract. Going out. This was written a couple of weeks ago, I imagine maybe even a few weeks, this report. So it says they're going out to public contract, Scotland. Just a quick uh, progress update, if that was possible. Lynn Danish. Thank you, Stuart. Yes, uh, the tender documents have been uploaded to the council, for the council to um, assess. So we're working on that just now. Uh, Programme-wise, we're looking at tender issue sometime in October, probably towards the end of October. We've got a few matters to resolve with the closed states and uh, public utility diversions, but uh, things are, are progressing quite well, yes. OK, we'll go to the recommendation. Before we do, there's a couple of actions on there, of course, uh, in, in future reports on completed projects. Can we get the cost on that? We're happy to do that. Yep. Uh, uh, so going to the recommendations, then, members, we've been asked to note 2.1, uh, agree 2.2, With the, the amendment to have the, the, the completed programme costing on that, yeah. Um, 2.3, note that. 2.4, agree that. 2.6, agree that. 2.7, note that. 2.8, note that. An additional one, 2.0, note to complement the workforce in ENI, specifically environmental, on the actions they have taken on, on um, the work that they, they do. Are we happy with that? Stephen? Yeah, so 2.6, uh, we're agreeing, not noting, is that right? Yeah, agreeing. Jim? To circulate the speeding paper. That'll be, that'll be an action rather right. than a recommendation. Thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you, members. We'll now move on to item number eight, which is the economic. Development class capital programme. So the purpose of this report is to provide a progress update on economic development capital programme 2018 to 21. There are, there are amendments to make to the report in the recommendations 2.1, 2.2. The reference should be paragraph 3.3, not 3.5, as is, is suggested. And the head of economic development will take any questions on the report unless you've got something to add, director. Uh, nothing to add at this stage, Chair. Thank you. John, anything to add? Nothing to add at this stage, Chair. Members? No questions, so we've got the recommendation. So we'd ask to note 2.1, uh, and at the end of it will be as detailed in 3.3 rather as in 3.5, and then 2.2, agree the funding allocation, uh, again 3.3 rather as 3.5. Is that agreed? Thank you. Oof. Then we'll go on to item number nine, which is the director's end of year assessment of business plan, performance, economy, environment and infrastructure. This report provides elected members with the director's end of year assessment of 2017-18 uh, end of year progress on delivery of the 2016-18 business plan for economy, environment and infrastructure director. The report also includes as appendices annual reports from environmental health and trading standards, appendices three and four respectively. <coughs> um, the director and heads of service will take any questions on, on the report. I will, however, say with the key, the, the, some of the key performance indicators that in the waste side of things, there is obviously that issue of the waste PFI contract where we did not have any opportunity to change or that it was very much... Um, reflected by the, the, the actual uh, contractor. Director, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, yes, Chair, thank you. And, and I would just reiterate the, the, that, that point the Chair has made, that there are eight of the KPIs which are, are read associated with uh, waste management, uh, and the uh, exception sheets uh, explain uh, the difficulties that we've had trying to get variations to the contract in the past, that would allow us to meet these targets that, that we did set ourselves uh, originally. However, members uh, obviously realise now that uh, the, the waste PFI has been terminated and we are in the process of bringing the service back in-house and we will need to review 
our KPIs going forward, and we'll bring members up to date on that review uh, when we report uh, the six-month, uh, halfway through the year, report on performance. I have to say the good news of that, of course, it will be under me members' direction what those KPIs will actually be for, uh, for a change. So members are open to any questions? Jeff? Well, it's just a, a general question in the exception report on page 115 about the EIS system. I mean, I, I find the EIS system quite useful, um, but my continual complaint about this is although the final response we received is that such and such an item of work will be done, we're never actually told it has been done. Have, are we making any progress with regard to that? Okay. You want to answer this, or you want to? Yeah, I, I think I think there are a number of improvements we need to make in, in these responses. The, the unfortunate thing is that the number of inquiries we get are enormous, uh, and obviously uh, we're a reduced staff uh, through the savings that we're we're, we're making uh, throughout the year, and, and we will continue to do that in future years. So it is a case of the demand and trying to get an appropriate response back within the appropriate time scale. So we're doing our very best, and, and we are looking at that. And uh, I can only apologise to members if they've been frustrated in either waiting a response or on the quality of that response. But again, I must say, if there's another way of you trying to find out the information, please, please speak directly to officers. But the number we get is quite enormous. Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's, just, it's something that seems to re be recurring here quite quite often as uh, the personal personnel reviews um, EEI. I know there's difficulties with people not all working in the in the one office and things that makes it a bit hard. But I think really when we're down at 62 percent of people getting an annual review, I think I think that is uh, really seriously needing to be to be addressed. And I wonder if there's a slight correlation between that as well and your kind of high sickness record. You've got 12.68 days with a target of nine. Is there, is there a correlation between the two things? Are staff feeling motivated, feeling valued? And part of this annual review is a big part of that. Director? Yeah, there is no doubt uh, uh, that we do have an issue here. Uh, it's an issue that's appeared before in our performance report. Uh, we have to tackle it. PDRs are extremely uh, important. Uh, they not only uh, give uh, uh, an exchange between line management and, and officers in general, but they also uh, give a feel for how officers are feeling and, 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 and how they are, how their well-being is, and, and we have to take all of that into cognizance. It's also very important from a training perspective uh, that, that we have a training programme uh, lined up through these PDRs uh, that staff can make uh, make progress uh, and, and continue uh, to be effective in their job, uh, and that's that's all very essential. We have a large workforce that's uh, not all an email, uh, for example, but we have again a simpler form of PDR that we give that workforce, uh, the bus drivers and, and, and all, 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 all the services that, and enterprise and services. Uh, and it's a case of just making sure we have the discipline that these are getting done. Uh, and we have to measure that against the resources we have. And is it a case that everybody's just doing too much? I'm not sure. But it is something that the management team will look at very, very closely. And it's something we must improve. And I accept that responsibility as director. I think there was the issue at p and when I raised it as well, because obviously there is that, that link. But I think it's important for members of staff to understand what they are contributing to the, the whole council, not just the directorate as well. And, and, and P PDR Quick is, is a way of actually doing that. So I think you're right to raise it, and I think the director is, is doing his best to, to, to get that, that um, culture of getting those PDRs sorted out. Um, Roz? Thank you, Chair, yeah. Uh, page 135, um, regarding the Harbour Revision Order. Um, I'm just a bit confused about um, this issue. Um, it, it's obviously taken um, a lot of time um, to not get the Harbour Revision Order. So I've got two questions about this. What is the implication of not having a Harbour Revision Order? If we'd had a Harbour Revision Order, how would that have, have affected 
the decision to put a barrier up at the harbour, and also, how do we know we're going to get it in 2023? And what's that all about? I don't... James, you know something? Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Surtees, um, with respect to the Harbour Revision Order, this is a, an item that dates back uh, many years um, to the, the point following a uh, fatalities and a, and a marine accident investigation branch investigation and report, um, which required uh, the establishment of a single statutory harbour authority for Loch Ryan. Um, there is quite a significant history in, in background papers uh, with uh, both this committee, its predecessor, and the Harbour Subcommittee, and I'm more than happy to offline discuss more detail. Um, the challenge has been for quite a number of years uh, persuading the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, the MCA, that a single statutory harbour authority for the whole of Loch Ryan is not appropriate to the risks that are present to the point where we have undertaken navigational risk assessments and shown that, in fact, the risks within the harbour area are, are reasonably small. Uh, and certainly something that a, a harbour authority, a single harbour authority, probably wouldn't prevent happening. So it's it's how much money do you invest to reduce a risk that is actually quite low. Um, so very recently, after continually bantering the, the MCA, and I'll, I'm going to take credit for just beating them up all the time and having the director and the chair and, and everybody writing to, in fact, to Sir Alan Massey, the, the chief executive of the MCA, to say this is we need to get a pragmatic solution to this. Ultimately, the MCA have recently come back and said that we can probably take a two-stage approach. So the southern half of the loch, which is the area that's of importance to Dumfries and Galloway Council, uh, we would look to be the statutory harbour authority for that area, which gives us uh, control over Stranraer Harbour, but also control over an area where if we want to promote, for example, regattas and things like that, we would have control over the vessels within that area. Um, the northern half of the loch would be to be determined in the future, um, and that would be in discussion with the, the two ferry companies. So um, we, we have that. The next stage will be to go back to Harbour Subcommittee with further reports on, on how we would take that forward. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, James, for that. And it, that sounds incredibly complicated, and I would appreciate um, an update offline. However, I'm aware that we've got the World Skiffy Championships coming next year, and we're also developing the, the harbour and the marina, and it sounds like it, things are happening, you know, really quickly. Would that give you credence to, to hurry this process up? I mean, certainly, uh, I'll, I'll be at uh, a meeting tomorrow about the, the, the World Skiffy Championships, and, and uh, if there's any queries coming out from that meeting, then we will, we will take that forward as well. Um, obviously, the Council, through colleagues in economic development and in, in uh, Stephen's team, are very supportive of, of anything that we can bring, these, these kind of things, and that is very much the approach we've looked at to take on the southern half of the law. Um, so I'll, I'll continue with that. If there's any concerns raised through that, we have very close working relationships with Stenner and P&O, um, so we can bring them into the equation as well to support anything that, that's being done, particularly with that, that championship coming up next year. Director, you want to come in? Yeah, ju just on the barrier, there is no connection whatsoever between the health and safety works that we've done in the harbour and the revision order. Jim McComb, Green Nicol, Richard Brody, Ian Carruthers and John Young. Thanks, Chair. On page 122, there is an anticipation that paper, card and plastics will be reduced at Echo Deco, and that gives rise to two questions. Firstly, where will these materials then be processed? And secondly, will there be a sufficient flow of mixed waste to justify echo to echo continuing. Director, under Steve. Right, uh, th thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, as I explained, obviously the PFI has now terminated and we're bringing the service back in-house. We are currently going through a two-month uh, transition period where, with Renewy where uh, we're, we're getting to understand all the equipment and, and how it works and really what it says on this page 
we have to review totally and utterly uh, to understand how we go forward. There is no doubt that there will be uh, a sufficient uh, stream of residual waste to keep EcoDeco uh, in, 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 in operation. Uh, there are also the opportunities to speak to other councils in Scotland, where we have one of the very few facilities, uh, and certainly in, in, in getting continued support from the Scottish Government on funding, uh, they are speaking to us on the basis of using EcoDeco as a national asset rather than just a regional asset. So it, it has a very strong future, but it's something that we are getting our heads round, getting our hands round as we and take these services in-house and we'll be in better place to advise members uh, in November, for example, how things are developing. You're welcome back, Jim. Please, Chair. Where is the current stream of, of a segregated waste from Wigtownshire processed? Steve? So there's the uh, source separated, uh, collected, uh, tins, cans, plastics, paper, card. Um, that's taken to, uh, it's collected, and, and, and the food waste as well collected separately. These are taken to uh, the, the new Stranraer Zero Waste Park, uh, and they're bulked up. Uh, there's a cost to have the food waste taken off, and it goes to, uh, generally goes to anaerobic digestion plants in terms of breaking it down and, and, and taking the gases off it for energy production. Uh, and the other, other waste streams, we tend to, what we do is we uh, place the materials at either the lowest cost for us, if there's a gate fee to take them away, or with some of the recyclables, where actually we get, we get the highest income. Uh, and those can be generally uh, into the central belt, into other processors who'll take our plastics, uh, who'll take our glass. Uh, or to take our tins and, and, and aluminium cans. Uh, so it's a, we can uh, play around in the, on the, on the market, uh, the kind of small market for these things, and we can uh, play and place the materials where we get the best return in terms of the recyclables. And in time, as we roll that service out, uh, we'll have probably economies of scale uh, and possibly uh, the opportunity to seek better prices for some of the recyclables as we produce greater volumes of recyclable materials. Can, can I just take this opportunity to advertise APSI again, because the amount of work that's going on on the waste and the energy side of things in, in, in all councils around the UK is actually written in some of the, the, the reading that comes from APSI. Uh, there's, there's, there's new processes happening in Europe, which we're actually looking at as well, which is actually taking material from landfill sites and taking that into uh, waste to energy plants. Um, and I think there's massive opportunity there. So, if members can get along to some of the APSI conferences and APSI advisory groups to give them a better understanding of what's actually going on, it's about best practice and sharing that. I mean, the director mentioned about not reinventing the wheel um, before. That's basically what, it, what, what it's about, and it's a quite a good area. I think Ian's been to a few APSI conferences before. Um, I think, yep. So, um, Chair, can I just ask on that? Is there funding for elected members to attend these conferences? And we, do they have a we course? are a member, so therefore there's usually three places. Okay, thank you. Um, Graham? Thanks, Chair. It's uh, not a question, it's a comment and, and a response to Alistair's uh, answer with regard to response times for inquiries. Um, I was at a community council last night and the, 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 there was a lot of criticism of the fact that a, 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 a question had been asked and no response had been forthcoming in a relatively uh, reasonable length of time. I will take that up with the relevant officer uh, himself. But the reputation to the council is such that it, it is not a good reputation we're getting. That's the first point. The second point is when I suggested it was maybe down to lack of resources due to the fact that we have less people I was poo-pooed, and uh, I was told that that was a piece of nonsense. Now, I don't need to go to community councils to be told that what we do is a piece of nonsense. Well, sometimes I'm sometimes aware of that. But it is not doing the reputational uh, of the council any good. And I would urge the... the, the it, was, it was an EEI thing. It was actually a Rose department. But um, I will speak, as I say, I will speak with a relevant officer directly. But I just feel that we are not getting the message out there that we have got 11, 1,200 people less than we did 
three or four years ago, and there will be there will be more people to go, and and the, we just not get not that the, they can't expect. We pay our taxes. I said, well, maybe you do, but it's only a very small proportion of what we actually spend, and they're not we're not getting that message out to the general public that we have got less uh, resources and that things will either take longer or they won't get done at all. That's just, sorry, it's not a question. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a, a ramble there. Like, but I, 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 think, I think, you know, the un understanding of the communication of what the council actually is is sometimes really important for local communities to understand. And if you ask a, a council, ask a member of the public what the community do, they say, what does the council do? They say, we empty your bins. They don't understand all the other intricacies of, of the council. And I think it's part of the, the process going forward of that communication of the budget setting process. We have certainly asked as an administration that people understand where the, the, the knock on effect of having a budget cut uh, actually is. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got Richard. Thank you, Chair. Uh, page 99. Uh, the, one of the targets, KPIs, the second bottom one, number of young people under 25 accessing the Deficient Gallery Employability Award, uh, target 150, value 54, but the trend's going up. It says there's an exception report, but I, I can't find it. Maybe I've missed it, but I can't find that one. It'd be interesting to know a bit about that one. Probably because they're all leaving the area and going up north. Um, John? Um, earlier in the year, we did have a report that came in um, regarding the way that we would uh, refocus our, our um, employability and skills service. Um, challenged, we were very challenged when it came to a lot of the young people that we are dealing with, um, especially regarding the employability award. We've done exceptionally well and there's lesser of a demand. So the focus that we now will have on our services is more looking at the harder to reach people. Also, the other part that we're doing with our employability and skills service, we are aiming to focus on our priority areas. So it, rather than it all being clustered um, in the centre, it's, go, it's going out to services. So that's the aim that we, that, that we have. And this is, why, this is why we refocus the service and this is why we came to committee to ask that. So that was done I think back in, um, back in April or May when we did that. So we expected this and we expected some challenges and that is why the refocus happened. Page 128 for your graph. Um, we've got Ian, John Young and then Stephen. Thank you, Chair, as quick as I can. Uh, I think just kind of in order, I think page 105, there was a question that was just in my mind, just was, Waste PFI. We've had that described. We understand what's going on there. And I guess we're no longer in that contract. Things are we're in a transition period and it's moving on. But I just wonder what that would look like this time next year. Hopefully, that's a we'll get some kind of turnaround there as we go forward. So that was the only kind of comment there, Chairman. I think uh, 2.3 and 2.4. I think to commend the level of work that's went to them two reports: the environmental health and the train standards. And on page 125, Chairman, in Appendix Two, I think there has to be some kind of comment in regards to that. So it shows we've got a 90% target here. For the last number of years we've been performing out the box, so it's sitting at 95%, so we're outperforming the target. There's an obvious drop there. And what came out of my mind, obviously, DG1, press a cold report, we've had that, with North West ca Campus and Grenfell, obviously, but building standards in particular plays a very, very important role to the, it's one of the services that we deliver across Dumfries and Galloway. To say the least, there's no criticism here. Maybe we've got an understanding of what's going on in regards to the back office stuff as it, as it speaks about in that exception report. But I think this needs to be sorted out as quickly as we can. It needs to be resourced at the right level, whether it's staff or whether it's uh, probably more around about technology, I think it seems to be. Hopefully that is the case. But I think we need some kind of reassurances with everything that's going on countrywide and locally that uh, this is being looked at carefully, Chairman, and it's been brought into order. Well, first of all, I'll agree with you on, on the, the Environmental Health and Trade and Standards Report. I think they're exceptional reports with the, the staff that we've actually got there. And when you look at what they've done over the years uh, and what they're trying to do, um, you can only congratulate both, both the departments what they're doing. Steve, on the other issue. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, there's, there's clearly a link between the, the two uh, exception reports or the three exception reports relating to uh, building standards. Um, and this was really a continuation. These are the year-end 
figures, uh, this is a continuation of the, of the trend that we reported at the six month um, period uh, last year where we had, we did report on the, the issues that we were having um, on a number of fronts, uh, particularly with the back office system and the um, changeover to the um, e-building standards process, um, combined with um, some of the issues that we experienced in terms of the availability of, um, of support staff, uh, admin support staff that was, that was creating that the two of those factors together were creating significant delays in terms of issuing uh, building warrants and completion certificates. That's reflected, I think, um, in, in both of these um, exception reports. Customer satisfaction levels have, have dropped um, significantly uh, by the end of the year. The other, the other thing I would point out in relation to the customer satisfaction rating is that we have now moved to a different way of measuring customer satisfaction and we're now part of a national uh, consortium that's coordinated through um, Scottish Government where a standard set of questions are now asked uh, across um, all 32 uh, building standards um, authorities. <clears throat> so it's, it's not strictly comparable one to the other. So we'll probably get a better indication once this year's survey has been carried out as to, as to whether we're, we're, we're now improving. However, um, those issues have been addressed in the intervening period. Uh, we now are fully uh, staffed up in terms of the, the support staff uh, within, the, within the service. Uh, there was a considerable um, amount of training required. Um, those of you that have um, interacted with both e-planning and e-building standards will understand the complexities of the system. So the new admin staff coming in have to be provided with training. Um, <clears throat> we've also been working very closely with uh, BTS and our external provider, IDOCS, to try to resolve some of the software issues. Uh, they um, have not been fully resolved, but there, have, there has been a, a marked improvement in the performance of the back office system, um, such that certainly in recent months, the levels of complaints has, has dropped off um, quite significantly and noticeably. So I would anticipate that for this year's uh, outturn figures that, that, that there will be an improvement on these ones. Welcome back, Ian. I just, very, very briefly, I'll just say a few words, Jim. I think it, I use that when it, it reflects the public uh, perception of what's going on within there. We get feedback, especially those of us, I think, on the, some seems to be a correlation between those of us sitting in the Planning Application Committee and building standards, the phone is for all this stuff. So through our casework as well, it's been getting higher and higher, but it means certainly tailing off to what it was. But I think if it's some simple, solutions as Steve's outlined in regards to better technology, even technology when uh, Malcolm and I went round and had a look and had a discussion, it was really informative as we mentioned before, but I think so inspectors can do things on site and just pop that information in, it's transmitted there and then, just like we, we have that available as councillors, so I think it should certainly be put down to our staff, so no, thanks for the for the reports, we'll look to see that improving as the, as the, as the year goes on, Chair. Thank you for that. Um, we'll go to John and then Steve and then we'll go to the recommendation. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Environmental Health, page 155. The, the, this report is, seems to suggest that the Council will still carry out a WASP removal service. This isn't the case. The, the operator who did provided the service is retired due to ERVS. And I just wondered if if it would be possible for people phoning the council and requesting a pest control that the council would be in a position to give out trusted trader details because pest removal, to my mind, is a sort of panicky, worrying situation for a lot of people and they may end up being severely overcharged. So I just wondered if the council could recommend trusted trade, trader firms who could provide services like wash removal. I'll ask um, Greg Douglas to uh, maybe come forward and help with um, addressing the, the, the operational question. Could I just point out, though, that this is an annual report for performance in the previous financial year. So it's the financial year ended 31st of March. So it reflects the, the service that we were providing uh, during the course of that year. We, as you correctly say, we've had to make some changes and adjustments to our service this year. Um, to, to reflect the fact that we um, had, to, had to make savings uh, and environmental health savings were taken as part of the budget process. Uh, and that will obviously be reflected in the annual report that we produce covering uh, this year's activities. 
Okay, Greg, before you, before you sort of come in and talk about the trusted tree, I'll, I'll, I'll just sort of prompt one of my ex servicemen's um, businesses called LA Clearway. They do that sort of thing, John, and they're a trusted trader group. Uh, Councillor Young, we'd, we were um, asked to have a wee look at that before. There was only one trusted trader on the site for pest control who dealt with the Dumfries area. Uh, and really, this is a, a problem that obviously is going to be faced by households across Dumfries and Galloway. Um, so if there were, if other traders come forward during the trusted trader scheme, I'd be happy to, to put that forward. I don't have a problem with that. Okay, thank you for that. And could the Council recommend these trusted traders? But, <clears throat> Chair, the, the, the whole way in which the trusted trader scheme works is that it's, it's self-recommending, it's self-policing, because it goes on the basis of feedback from other customers. So <clears throat> the very fact that traders are on the trusted trader scheme, first of all, means that they have been assessed and verified by, um, by trading standards, so they have been checked. <clears throat> and secondly, they are there on the strength of feedback that they get from customers, which is fully open for the public to see, so it becomes self self regulating in that respect. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, I suppose uh, it was really. I mean, I'm glad it's been recognised because the two reports for environmental health and trading standards uh, are uh, actually very readable, very informative, and the data is laid out in a very interesting way. And I appreciate it's for the previous year, but I also appreciate it won't be as page 143 suggests about uh, eating venison and drinking champagne as part of the testing, uh, <laughs> the provenance of foods, etc. But I think uh, what I'm sort of getting to with both reports is that um, the measurement, the exception report for the growth in registered small and medium-sized businesses, uh, page 129, where effectively it's shown there's a, a downturn in the economy, which obviously is out with, to a large extent, the council's control. However, given, I mean, that we've had a number of reports recently where we've had to, I suppose, review our assumptions about uh, what income we can generate, what the economy is looking like, etc. I, I don't think it's it's not unuseful to have this kind of measurement here, not to beat ourselves up about it, but just to recognise this is the environment we're in, uh, and that even though we may not feel that uh, we're supporting businesses directly in terms of uh, economic regeneration or that type of support, the sort of arm of the council and the authority of the council reaches much further in terms of like, you know, inspecting businesses, whether it's for food safety or um, uh, providing this, the, the provenance of our goods or uh, trusted traders, for example, or people's confidence in using local businesses. So I think we're, we're actually doing ourselves a disservice by saying, well, we don't support these businesses. We're actually providing a, a good place to do business and providing that assurance. So I think there's maybe, I wouldn't rush to get rid of this measurement I think maybe maybe it could measure something else in a more nuanced way, but <clears throat> I think we need to recognise the climate that we're in, but also realise that actually we maybe do more than we think we do, um, and it might not be directly supporting in terms of cash or, or startups or whatever, but actually we're keeping the businesses that are there to a high standard, and at least to the best of our abilities. So I think maybe there's something to, rather than just ditch this, maybe refine it a wee bit, just, suggest, just as a suggestion. Thanks. I mean, Jan, Jan's here to sort of answer that question, but I, w I, would, I would suggest that every 40 pence in the pound that the, the council spends is spent in, 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 in local, small, small to medium enterprises. That was a, a, a figure I got from the chief exec up in, in, in Edinburgh last week. So we are doing a, a lot more than what some, some would actually say. Jan, can you come? Yes, I would agree. It's, it's, um, it's really important that for our businesses, that we are there to support them, and you're quite right with trading standards. It does its job to support um, with environment, mental health for our, our, especially for our food in industry. That is so vital. The food industry makes about 25% of our overall turnover in Dumfries and Galloway, which is 4.8 million, uh, 4.8 billion pounds. Um, so that's an industry of 1.2 billion pounds. But also, when we think about our roads, we think about the place elements that we have here. And looking at this, if we, we look at the future, we must turn things around and look at our place. And this is one of the key elements that we have here in Dumfries and Galloway. Number one being the economy is, is, is a priority. Number two, we look at an inclusive Dumfries and Galloway 
bring those together and the other two things that we, we make sure our young people have the best start in life and we look after the vulnerable. So this indicator, whilst we look at it just black and white, yes, there are areas we don't have control in. We do have it control when it comes about our wraparound offer for Dumfries and Galloway as a whole, so I'll be happy to keep this in. Okay, thank you very much. Members, we're now going to the recommendations. We've been asked to, in 2.1 review, which I believe we have done. We've asked to scrutinise, what I believe we have done in 2.2. Um, in 2.3, we agree and congratulate the Environment and Health Annual Report, and 2.4, agree and congratulate the Trading Standards Annual Health Report. Would that be good? Thank you very much. Then we move on to item number 10, which is the Economy, Environment, Infrastructure Director Business Plan 2018 19 to 2022 23. This report pre uh, represents a draft Economy, Environment, Infrastructure E and I business plan for 2018 19 to 2022 23 for approval by this committee. The purpose of this business plan is to provide a performance framework for the delivery of council plan priorities and commitments which are within the remit of the E&I Directorate. The Directorates and the Heads of Service will take any questions on the report unless you've got anything to add, Director. Uh, nothing to add, Chair, thank you. Members, Malcolm. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, there's quite a lot to go through in this report, and uh, but I can't help but focus on the fact that it's referred to in 3.6 succession planning skills development, leadership management capacity, and 3.7, the workforce plan. The, the thing that's causing the biggest element of risk throughout this is the, the demograph of the, of the workforce. We've got a huge percentage of people between 50 and 59, and um, until we can try and attract more young people into the, into the council, I think we're going to be facing a skill shortage very soon. You know, because people are going to be taking ERVS, we've got cost saving measures coming in, people will be applying to go, and we're going to end up losing an awful lot of very skilled people from the council. So I would like, on the basis of 3.7, the workforce plans means under development requires to be pulled together, and we are getting a report coming back, but I would just like a wee bit of reassurance that you know this has taken as what I would consider about top priority. Um, and, and I would agree with you, and I think you'll find every public sector organisation is finding the same problem of our young people, our young people moving out of the area and, and coming back to what Jan said earlier on, it's about that place and making sure those people, young people want to stay within the area with good quality jobs. But, Director, you want to come on? I, I, I recognise exactly what, what Councillor Johnson's saying. I, I think our, our workforce plan, our succession plan, uh, very important for the future. I think the way it's laid out in the business report, it, it, it goes through uh, service by service, but I think what I'm, what, what I'm trying to say in 3.7 is we need to round that off and come back with, with, with a clear indication uh, what the next steps are. Uh, it obviously uh, has a direct co correlation with the work that's been done on the transformation of the council and the tr through the transformation board. And we will work in parallel with that as we go forward and to, to see what the future is going to look like. But it is a challenge, and it's a challenge throughout the Council, not only in EEI, but I do acknowledge and I do accept that it's an issue we have to address. Thank you very much, Katie. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the report coming before me. First of all, I'd just like to give my apologies that I wasn't able to attend in person the Forward Business Plan Seminar. Um, unfortunately, the Skype session didn't work. I believe I ended up on the floor at one point and trying to do a Skype session in group work within this particular environment doesn't work. Through the microphone, yep, it was great, but the moment you were into group work, I didn't get it. So if any of the points I'm about to raise was an opportunity to discuss there, I apologise in advance for that. But there's a few of the bits that I would like to just highlight and just have specific questions, if I, if I may. Um, the first... I'm looking at page 243, and we've got the under our key performance indicators the number of farms checked to ensure legal compliances. Now, our target has been 300 for the last three years, and we're keeping that, but yet we've never once made those targets. So is it realistic to keep the same targets that we've missed for the last three years and still carrying on? 
I'll go through them and then you can come back, maybe that's easier. Um, in terms of implementing our active travel strategy on page 247, can we have a link to that active travel strategy? That would be useful just because I did have a look online and I couldn't find a current one. I found an old one. That may be the one that we're working on, which is fine. Um, in terms of page 253, um, we're discussing developing a Southwest 400 tourism route. Now, the Southwest 300 has already been launched. So my question is, why on earth are we looking to develop a Southwest 400 when the 300 route is already actively being promoted? Um, as far as I can tell, the 400 includes areas of Ayrshire, which isn't, may not be of direct benefit to us, but I may be wrong in that. So that would be useful. And also establishing a Locate in Dumfries and Galloway campaign. It's the first I've heard of this. Is this something that's coming forward that we've not had a chance to discuss? And finally, in regards to our leader programme, we've got it within this. However, my under well, I'm not my understanding. Is there any funding left within that actual pot? Because we've included it in our plan, but if there's no funding there, why on earth have we got it in our plan? So... I can answer that because myself and Andrew are on, on the leader board. There's, there's fun until March 2019 and then it finishes after that. It's, it, it's nearly 95% allocated, but they're bringing the two two strands of that together to, to put funds, which because the app, application's in um, and it will cover the full application. Okay, so there are, are sort of four other questions there. Yeah. I'll take the... First one, Chair, if that's okay, because it does relate to um, the activities of um, our trading standards team. Uh, the reason that the, um, the target has not been changed this year is that we, we are reprioritizing the work uh, within the team this year to have much more focus on meeting some of our uh, basic inspection requirements. So it's not just within um, this area is also in some of the other areas in terms of inspections of, of shops and other premises. We're actually refocusing the work, and I think that's that's picked up as well in the trading standards annual annual report. It, it gives a, a lead into that to say we need to be um, basically back to basics in terms of looking at our inspection regimes. Can, can I just come in on that, team? Because obviously the trading standards letter that I sent off to COSLA and and the, the minister. But just come back, and I don't think I've had a response from COSLA yet. But obviously, trading standards in its own right has been potentially contracted or tendered for. Where are we with that? Chair, the, we've just been advised last week that the, um, the closing date for submitting bids has now been extended to towards the end of the month. Um, we are working up our uh, proposals with a view to submitting uh, the bid in, in time. So our lobbying has worked then? We, we received no direct response, but um, we're certainly uh, on the list in terms of um, the invitation to tender. Page 247, travel. travel. Yes, I'll, I'll provide a link to the active travel strategy. If it's not on the council website, I'll, I'll email a copy, make it available. 253 Southwest 400. Okay, in the local in the um, council plan 2018-2022, um, 20, it is actually written develop an S, um, SW400 tourism route in the to mirror the success. That's actually taken from that. That is the same for um, establish a dedicated locate in Dumfries and Galloway campaign. They are both within there. Um, with respect to the 400, I'm just wondering whether that is because if we looked at the Sol Solway Firth, you would start from Gretna and work across where I believe that most of it is in the West, um, totally in the West. That creates another membership opportunity. I understand that the group is called um, South West 300 or Visit South West 300, and we will support that. This is just, the other, this is just what is written in the text and the same board located in Dumfries and Galloway. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, Roz? Do you want to? Thank you very much, Chair. I've lost my place, but on page 135. 135? No. 
Um, I just wondered if we could get an update on the lobbying situation regarding improvement and lobbying of the um, the, the roads. Um, we, we're, we're supporting the 75 and the 77 action groups, and I believe there's a 76 action group also. Uh, with regard, regard to lobbying, I believe there is a, a, a report coming to November E and I committee. Uh, and with regards to the 75 77 action group, we were going to be going to that, but it was it was cancelled, postponed, was it? Um, very recently. Yeah. But yes, chair, we, we are due a report to the November committee on the lobbying on these major major roads, strategic roads. Yeah. And then Ian. Just briefly, I may be being pedantic, Chairman, but I think on page 303, about three quarters away down that page, it, it refers to the PFI payment, and just because we've discussed that, and we'll look to make a decision, I think, under 2.2 our recommendations. Got a figure there, 11 million in it, just over 11,604, I think it's referring to, so I don't know if that needs to be corrected as we move on, or just what does that mean in real terms? Just because we are agreeing the budget, it's, it would be nasty. That, is that accurate or inaccurate? Yes, yes. Sorry, sorry, Chair. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. So that, so that PFI payment, uh, that what that is, that is the budget that we have for running the in-house service now, uh, and and that will have to be changed to reflect that. So yes, when these these were pre-prepared before we rushed into this period where we, we we've terminated the contract. So the eleven six oh four represents the budget that we have to live within. And, and PPP, of course, not just PFI. Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I think that's just a term. It's the PFI payment. Yeah. So, Chair, thanks very much for that clarification. I thought that's what it was. I would just imagine when we get to the decision, we maybe need to know if that needs to be amended or whatever, whatever way yeah. brought forward. Okay, members, just go to the recommendation then. We've been asked to agree 2.1 and 2.2. Sorry, did you, want, did you want in? Be happy to give it. Okay, thank you very much. We'll then move on to item. I would really just to note, though, that thanks to the Conservative group to agreeing to the the issue on page 252 uh, to progress the White Sands project. So appreciate their support on that. Okay, thank you. Right, we've, got, right, we've agreed the, the recommendations. Okay, we'll move on to item 11. Um, Item 11 is building standards compliant in fire safety, a consultation of making Scotland building safer for people to respond. This report uh, presents for members consideration the draft response to the Scottish Government's consultation on the review of the building and fire safety regulatory frameworks in order to help ensure the safety of people in and around Scotland's buildings. The Head of Planning and Regulatory Service will take any questions on the report. This is a response to the consultation. I um, we've got Max along from building standards. Um, are you going to add, Director? Uh, nothing tied to the report, Chair. Thank you. Members, any questions? Yep. Okay, we'll go to the recommendations then. Members are asked to consider draft response and agree to its submission to Scottish Government. Thanks for all your work on that, Max. Well done. And Steve? Yep. Um, now we... Um, <laughs> It's a good job the mic was doing it. That one, Alistair, I'll tell you. Local development plan, supplementary guidance, to our conservation character, appraisal and management plan for adoption following consultation. This report seeks approval for the adoption of our conservation area character, appraisal and management plan with amendments made following the responses received to the public consultation for six weeks. The Head of Planning and Regulatory Service will take any questions on the report. Unless you've got anything to add, Steve? Nothing to add, Chair. Thank you. Rose? I'd just like to welcome this report and all the work that's going. I know we're not supposed to talk about my ward, but it's here in black and white and colour, in fact. And I'm just really grateful for all the work that's going on in Stranra. It is strategic and it's part of the LDP uh, policies and things like that. So. <laughs> Ian? It's just a small point, well, it's worth debating because it kind of slips in with the local review body last week and it's been there two or three times at different, whether it's planning application or local review, whatever that type of process. So in conservation areas, when it comes to 
sash and case. Some people call it case and sash, but sash and case windows are certainly how I would describe them. It's the type of materials that are being used. So we've had numerous uh, comments, I suppose, the best way to describe it in regards to that type of material. Could, is plastic or PV, UPVC an option in these, these areas? Certainly in Edinburgh, they, they use it. Can allow it to be used so long as it's like for like, it's a replica. I just wondered, I mean, it's Wigton in particular. I can't hear what local members are saying there, but I know I've got a vocal local member in, in my group. It's quite clear that things that actually, when it comes to uh, the type of material that's being used, we should have a have a more of a relaxed, I think, view when it comes to it. Ken, and uh, I, I, I've said it many times. You stand twenty meters back or so from a house, and whether it's got white or uh, whether it's got PVC or wood, uh, with the green effect and that that can be incorporated into this uh, materials and manufacturing technology that we've got now, I can't tell the difference, Chairman. I think you'll agree with me on this. Ian. Any application that comes forward will be. Um decided on its merits, uh, making sure it's fitted by policies and standards, etc., that, that we need to have. I don't think this is the place to, to, to sort of raise that question. It would be during the LDP process. This is a, a, a policy for, for Stranraer Conservation Area. Unless, Steve, you've got anything to add, add to that? Chair, yeah, thank you. Um, this obviously is in the context of a detailed piece of work that we've carried out in regard to um, Stramra conservation area. The content of, of these documents then forms part of the decision-making process on individual um, planning applications. Uh, that's why it's important that we have this um, guidance in place. Um, the guidance itself is an interpretation of policies that are contained in, in the local development plan, so it's not the place of the guidance to, to, to restate um, or to change policy that's in, uh, that's in the LDP. Uh, the policy in the LDP refers to um, materials um, being um, in character and in keeping with the character of existing historic um, areas and historic buildings. Each case is, is decided on its merits and it's interesting that, that this point should come up because I've recently had a letter of complaint from the Architectural Heritage Society saying that we grant too many planning permissions for UPVC windows in conservation areas. So <clears throat> we're, um, we're obviously applying a pragmatic approach. There is no blanket policy which rules out um, UPVC replacement windows within conservation areas where a much stricter um, test is applied, uh, it, that is in the case of um, listed buildings. So where it is a listed building, there is a, there is a much higher bar that's set uh, in terms of the steps that have to be gone through so that we remain in keeping with um, historic environment Scotland policy on uh, listed buildings. But within conservation areas, there is, a, there is a slightly more relaxed approach, as I say, such that um, recently, I received a letter of complaint from Architectural Heritage Society. Can we come back on I mean, absolutely. I mean, so what I'm hearing there, to setting your, your comments to the side, Chairman, but that, so there's no actual rule that says PVC can be used. It's just it's, it's the way it's being viewed, I think, as it comes forward. And I just think that it's no explicit, maybe here, or maybe we're mere vocal as it comes forward to main ward, but I mean, I certainly have representatives from group members to say that, listen, and more experience through the planning committee and uh, Local review body that actually seems to be more of a, a relaxed view, when it, especially when it comes to places that are exposed to extreme climate uh, conditions. And the west of the region certainly has that, whether it's really sharp winds, uh, cold, and it's so. You, and so, plastic windows, I would say, and I would justify it in saying it, so better levels of U value draft roofing makes all the difference in the winter when it comes to heating and the comfort of quality of life of somebody living in that, in that premise. So no, I take on board what you're saying, Chairman. So it's no, it's not it's ruled in, it's ruled out. It's just it's in the view of of a, of a, a I suppose our expert planners are saying that they would probably prefer that the timber each case in its own merits. But I think there's a, if there's any possibility at all in which to uh, relax it, I would say, and actually, so long as it looks the same, it's like for like that we should consider that. Okay, thanks for that. Um, David, you want to come in? I just briefly on the same point. I mean, I, I tend to uh, agree with Ian, and I wanted to ask Roger whether the problem is he can't um, um, specify uh, which UPVC windows might be used, because as Ian pointed out, some of them are very good, and you can't tell the difference. Same with the uh, cast iron rain uh, 
rain gear can be very good, but is it is it a problem that you have a binary decision to make whether you're allowing plastic or not? Or can you can you be very specific um, on which types of window could be used? Steve, I think there is um, guidance that's made available um, to applicants to draw their attention to the level of detail that needs to be included in their um, submissions to us. There are um, UPVC windows which are finely detailed and which are a good replica of traditional windows. There are also UPVC windows which, which are not. The point here really is that whilst we're talking about windows, we could also apply the same principle to all of the detailing of our historic buildings, whether it's front doors, whether it's chimney pots, whether it's skews, whether it's painting, whether it's rendering, all of the all of these little details combine to give an overall impression of a place. And the, the purpose of the management plan is to try to ensure that we manage our historic environments sensitively. It doesn't mean that we don't permit and allow change, but that we manage them in a, in a sensitive fashion, bearing in mind that historic environments are very important drivers to tourism and the visitor economy. And we have Sorry, to, we have to I totally agree with that, but my question was, are you allowed to say which specific window has to be put in at the point of planning permission, or does that have to wait to the warrant? Because that's the critical thing here. If you, David, I'll just hold you up there, because the planning application will have the details of what the planning application is. Now, there'll be drawings, etc., of, of what the... Yes, there is, David. I've, Steve. Where it's something as um, finite as a replacement window, then we would expect to see the absolute detail of the replacement window, including, um, for example, approving samples of the actual frame. So yes, we would we would get into that level of detail at uh, at an individual planning application stage. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm going to the recommendation. The members were asked to consider the responses. Uh, well, to the Strunoa Conservation Area Character Appraisal Management Plan and 2.2, remit the, power, the powers to the Head of Planning and Regulatory Service to notify Scottish Ministers of the Council's intent to adopt it. Are we happy with that? Okay, thank you. And then move on to item number 13, which is Dumfries Town Centre update report. This report provides an update to members on current work in regard to revitalising Dumfries Town Centre. Um, the Head of Economic Development will take any questions on the report unless you've got anything to add, Director. I have nothing to add, Chair. Thank you. John? I have nothing to add, Chair. Okay. Um, Member Stephen? Uh, thanks, Chair. I think um, reading through it, obviously, the uh, Mfrees members will have more um, maybe input on this, but uh, it was actually to do with the decision-making and the operational procedures on page 430. Uh, and I'm just conscious that, um, having read through the details, that... Um, it will be. I would imagine it will be a cross-council effort. This, so although there may be um, actions, etc., which would need to be clear reported back to this committee, um, I'm sure there will be activities and/or actions that will be the, the remit of scope of communities committee, for example, in terms of the the public realm or whatever. Um, so I'm just wondering, can we ensure to embed that kind of cross uh, directorate working? And, and if that can be somehow reflected so that the appropriate committees have sight of this and not just here where, you know, things could get uh, lost to some members and other committees. John? Thank you for that question. Uh, I suppose I've taken it as a given because I've been working very closely with colleagues and communities um, where this paper and the work that we've been doing has come jointly from communities because Harry Hay has the responsibility of um, the street scene. I also need to work, my team also needs to work with the town ambassador and also with the ward officer. So it is more than uh, a, an economic development project. Actually, this is a, a pan council initiative where active travel is important, where we will be delivering a lot of what's in the EEI business plan specifically for the town centre. And that's the type of shape that we were trying to do when you read 3.2, which actually pulls together more than just what the what EEI does as a, as a whole, but what everyone's doing, in particular the major events and festival strategy, that clean DG initiative, which was all out with 
So yes, take it as a given, but we'll make it more explicit in this report and we'll ensure that there are similar reports going through to communities. Thank you, John. Thanks, Chair. I welcome most of the stuff that's in, uh, in here with stuff that was discussed at the seminar. Quite good, like, but the short-term actions, there's no timeline for how long these are going to take. And as I say, also in the Town Centre Action Group, I'd like to know when this would be set up like, because it's quite important. We've heard this in the past and nothing's ever came out of it. So, so really the timelines when these would hopefully start because as I say in the past, we've started things and they've, they've overrun, so I'm not expecting to know when they're going to finish, but I'd like to know when we're going to start them. Thank you for that very good question. We are already starting, but we haven't established anything because we do not have the, um, the, the permission from this committee. But my aim is to get, as soon as we've got the permission, is to get this group brought together as soon as possible. Essentially, we are moving to the timeline of the budget process. So our, our economic master plan must be part of that process so that we get sign off as part of the new budgeting process. We know how tight our, um, our finances are. We're also put, we've already put out bids for the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund as well, and that will run in tandem if we're successful and get into the next phase with the budget process. So you will have that and we'll be able to bring that together. We want to work though in collaboration with partners and that's why we need this group. But it doesn't mean to say that we don't have an outline plan, we do. John? The lakes uh, removal of double yellow lines and things like that, you wouldn't think that would be to need that to get the things like that done. I have I have spoken to Roger on that and that, that action should be getting done very shortly. Uh, Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Chair. I was basically just going to go very much along the same lines as uh, Councillor Martin there. Um, you know, people are really desperate to see some action in the Freestown Centre and some of the things here could be speeded up. They're part of the, the Council plan, things like the parking strategy, which I know, again, has been called for before. And I've, I just, the same as Councillor Martin, I'm just like reassurance that this is going to I think the, the phrase we're using in other areas is uh, we're going to have a pace behind this, I think. <laughs> I'd just like to add in one other element. We've been working closely with the Dumfries uh, Building Heritage Trust and the Stove and with colleagues from communities and planning. And what we're intending to do on the 30th of September, if this is agreed, that we will be doing a condition survey of the town, town centre as a whole. This will be, we'll be looking for volunteers and I've already volunteered myself and my husband and I'm sure that some of you would be keen to volunteer yourself to be part of the, the team of 25 who will meet at the stove and working under the auspices of experts undertaking this condition survey which we will need in order to make these improvements. Thank you. Um, Jeff? Yeah, that's interesting if you would send a, an invite out to all the local members so we can actually put it in our diary. And just to echo what uh, John and Malcolm have already said, you know, we do, we do need to have some pace behind this because there's nothing happening in the uh, the town centre at the moment. Although it's positive, I think, in, as far as some of the uh, the local owners actually have got scaffolding up and they are painting empty properties, etc. So it's possible from that point of view. And addressing the uh, the additional street parking, we identified those years ago as part of the research behind the White Sands uh, regeneration project. So we know where we are, we know where they are, but we need them to actually be brought into use for the uh, people from the town. Okay, thank you. David? Thank you, Chair. Um, it says a group of interested partners with a commitment and track record of achievement in making Dumfries Town Centre a vibrant, economically and socially active and thriving place to work is going to be formed. That will be a pretty small committee, that's, and I don't think the Council will be on it, will it? Um, we, we're paid, I think, and elected to, to take actions which are positive. We should actually do something. That an action would be actually uh, making some parking spaces available. Rotation of parking would be a good thing. Um, decriminalisation so we can actually um, get some lifeblood back into the town. And speaking of lifeblood, taking away the cars from the town is crazy. I think uh, it's been quoted that there was a 30% drop immediately when that was um, in footfall and trade when that happened. Never came back. And... Um, one thing we are doing is, is this uh, town centre living fund, which I think is it's, it's quite 
it's, it's a good thing. I think it lacks a bit of transparency. And as much as no one knows who gets what, there are reports of people getting 100%, reports of people getting uh, rejected. But there will be a critical amount that could be given uh, where the take-up would be um, very good and organically levering in the, you know, the, the private investment would come along, and that could actually work. But I just think we need to crack on and do something. The public uh, actually expect, expect action. They're blaming us, and we're just creating, um, instead of flats and shops, we're just creating a talking shop. Thank you. I think we're stuck between a rock and a hard place in some of this consultation that actually happens. You need to understand what the community actually want within the, the, the town centre. We've done that uh, and we're hopefully finding a way forward. We do need to move on with some of the short-term uh, things that we've already said and, and, and members have been assured that that will actually happen. But Jan, can you... With respect to the town centre living fund, I believe that is under the auspices of um, the communities committee and I would believe that if this is a fund that is um, undertaken by the council, there would be a transparent mechanism, but this is out with this um, particular committee. But what we are trying to do, especially with this group, is get a critical friend, get people who are actually doing things. And I think you would be amazed at the amount of activity that is happening in the town centre, especially with the private sector. There's a wonderful website that's called Not on the Dumfries Town Centre, that is, that is organised by a local business person, and many people absolutely love it. Um, there are community groups such as the Stove, but also um, Peter Pan Moat Braid doing work. There's a significant amount of work that's happening also by property owners, as has been mentioned before. And what we want to do, be able to do is lever that work, but work collaboratively, because the council's not the only game in town. Before we talked about reducing budgets and these types of things, we want to make certain we have maximum effect of the £1.5 million that this committee has put towards the Dumfries Town Centre regeneration. And that essentially, that's what we're trying to do. And as you would have seen, that we've actually put a little bit of additional money in there because there will be short-term works that will need to be done. That will be done with our colleagues and communities who have that expertise. So please be assured there will be action, but I, I need your permission to move forth on this. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm delighted to see um, Dundee referenced on page 432. Dundee are given priority to electric vehicles. Now, I had extensive con conversations with Councillor Lynn Short from Dundee Town Centre and find out who funded and what initiatives there were to help provide <coughs> um, town centre charging points. And recently, the Scottish Government ha have identified considerable funding to enable 25 Scottish towns to become electric towns, and I suggest Dumfries makes an application to become one of these. I think you're absolutely right, John, and at the end of the day, we've also got Transport Scotland funding that can be, um, we can try and get uh, down here as well. Jan, are you in that on? Yes, we're on the, on the on the ball with this one. We've been working closely with colleagues in Enterprising DG who have been leading the way um, with electric vehicles, not just in our own, not just in our own um, estate, but also looking at the char charges, electric charges, and you may see something in transformation regarding that. However, uh, we want to see the town as a low carbon town. We're also aware that there's money with the UK government as well for these types of investments. So thank you so for us for your support, um, Councillor Young, and we'll certainly be putting that as one of our number one. Projects. Okay, thank you very much, members. We'll go to the recommendations. We've been asked to note 2.1 and agree 2.2. Is that okay? okay. Members, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, another urgent uh, piece of business, which is an update on the air station. We were asked to give a verbal update on that particular area. Um, you'll be aware that briefings have been sent out, but uh, the director wants to give a, a quick update on this particular one. Right, thank you, Chair. And, and members will be aware that we uh, circulated a briefing uh, recently with uh, a, an accompanying update from Eileen Howitt, who is the Chief Executive of South Ayrshire Council, and we'll continue to do that uh, as things proceed. Now, the update on that briefing uh, is that contractors have begun to erect scaffolding around the building from Saturday the 15th of September. Uh, the aim of these works is to put in place sufficient protective measures to address the public safety issues and reduce the extended exclusion zone as soon as it's safe to do so. 
To ensure the works can be completed as quickly as possible, contractors will operate 24 hours a day. The works are expected to be completed by mid-October 18, subject to progress, although this period may have to be extended. Once complete, this will allow greater access for the safe passage of trains, including those with more than four coaches, and passengers, and the reinstatement of services to sa stations south of Ayr. The wider programme of public safety measures at the building adjacent to Air Station, which includes the former station hotel, and the works to complete a structural survey will continue beyond this time. Now, members will be aware that there is a task force, uh, and that task force is, is, is a, an officer-led task force, and I can confirm that we are now represented on that task, task force through our transportation manager, and the task force met on Friday the 14th of September, that's just last Friday, and will meet again later this week. Indications given are that the emergency train and bus plan continues to operate well, albeit correspondence, correspondence is understandably increasing from residents south of air. Network Rail noted reopening south of air remains logically, eh, logistically difficult but are continuing to work with ScotRail on what would be required to run a temporary service south of Ayr. So that's an update that we have as recent as late yesterday afternoon. I will now circulate this to all members and I will continue to keep members update, updated as these updates arrive uh, at the Council. Katie, you want to come in, but remember this is an update, it's not a report as such. Um, there may, be, there may no. be a question that you can't get answered. No, it's not a question. It's just to say, as somebody who's having to use Air Station every Saturday, because I have to travel to Glasgow every Saturday, I can just confirm that the staff on the ground in Air are extremely helpful, to the point that the same person has asked me three weeks in a row, do I need to get a bus to Stranraer? Can she help? Can she carry anything? So it's just to confirm that actually for those who are needing to access those services that the staff are in place and actually everybody within this air station has been really really helpful so and also just to say thank you for the update so thank you very much for just one other thing and i think it's sorry throw me yeah i'll be very brief i'm very disappointed that this item seems to be getting say short shrift from the recent gallery council south air council is sitting around the table on a regular basis with western and giving regular updates to their members. We seem to be treating this as a, I mean, just to give a, there was plenty of time to give a, a, a brief a written report to, to this item. And I'm very disappointed that hasn't happened. Well, it is, Tommy, the, the brief has went out to all members on, on this. Um, the, the agreement that was put in place was it be a verbal update to this committee from, uh, there was no decision to be actually made on, on this. And then we now have a, a, a transport manager on, on, on the group. So no, that, that's where we are with that particular thing. The point I was actually trying to make was, if a, a written report is given, the press is more likely to pick up on it. Saves me getting 30, 40 phone, phone calls. If, if it's in writing, in the local press, exactly an update on what's happening. We seem to be very lax in that area. Talk about this outside and tell me, all right? The, the, the last thing I wanted to, 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 to say to members is, and it's, it's a matter of congratulations to actually Alistair and his family on two recent arrivals on Friday. Um, actually, his daughter had twins on Friday. Uh, two little boys. Two little boys. Um, and he's not going to start singing two little toys and all that sort of stuff either. But uh, I think uh, congratulations from this uh, to your family, Alistair. Thank you very much, members, and uh, we'll close the meeting.